your book um, a lot about a man named Carl Stow. Um, and he, he improved the lives of a variety of people, people who were really sick with emphysema. He helped singers and he helped Olympic runners. Can you talk a little bit about him and how he changed? Um, well, certainly how some coaches viewed how important breath was and also doctors. Yeah, this was an extraordinary story. I had never heard of this guy. And I had spent, you know, a year and a half really digging deep into breathing research. And then by happenstance, I stumbled upon his name. A friend referred me to his book, which has been out of print since 1971. Uh, it's called Dr. Breath. And he was, Carl Stout was a vocal teacher. He was a choral conductor. Mm -hmm. And he found that a lot of his singers in the chorus didn't have a lot of resonance and they had to keep gasping for air just every time they were singing. So he taught them to breathe more deeply in this very fluid way to develop their diaphragms. And the diaphragm is this huge muscle that sits underneath the lungs that sinks down when we take a breath in and then floats back up when we exhale. So by just increasing this diaphragmatic movement, he was able to help singers with their tone, with their resonance, hold longer notes. And he became so famous that the Met Opera brought him in to try to train uh, their opera singers who already knew how to sing pretty well. And here's this guy from, you know, down in uh, New Jersey who was teaching courses how to do this. So after doing this for years and years, the pulmonologists at VA hospitals on the East Coast, this was in the 50s, heard about him and said, hey, maybe you know something about breathing that we don't. And they had just hundreds and hundreds of emphysema patients. They had no idea what to do with these people. They put a little oxygen cannula up to their noses and shot them up with antibiotics and left them in a corner to die. That's literally how, how they dealt with these people. So he went in, this is a guy who isn't a doctor, who's a choral teacher, and found a way of developing their diaphragms because they had lost all ability to move their diaphragms. If you've seen an emphysemic breathe, they use all these other muscles in their necks and chest just to get a breath in because they've lost diaphragmatic movement. The only thing he did is he would massage their chest and teach them how to engage that diaphragm. And these people left for dead, walked out of the hospital, and they did this for 10 years. So the story's getting a little long. Hopefully it's not boring you. No, Good. no, it's not. My dad but, actually had emphysema. And just so our audience understands, emphysema, and correct me if I'm wrong, James, is when the smaller capillaries are uh, are unable to take in oxygen. So that's why emphysemics breathe so um, shallowly. And is that correct? Yes, it's it's the bronchioles uh, attached to the alveoli. For some reason, they de they de disconnect and because of disease so that oxygen is no longer able to get into the alveoli which which then would send it into the bloodstream and the red blood cells so that's that's exactly right so emphysema is is irreversible the damage that's caused by emphysema you can't grow new bronchioles or or alveoli or or any of those connections but what you can do is engage the rest of the lungs which are still not disease, which can still work perfectly well. But for some reason, the doctors weren't considering this. They were just saying, oh, you know, the, this lung tissue is permanently damaged. What can we do? Well, our lungs can hold six liters of air. Why not engage the lower lobes of the lungs? And that's exactly what Carl Stow went in and did for, for a decade. And he was able to do what nobody was able to do. And he According to the doctors there, what he was doing was medically impossible, and yet the x-rays didn't lie, and the patients didn't lie, and they kept walking out of the hospital. And then, and then he went on to Yale running team and then to, the, mm -hmm. to train Olympians. Yeah, so this guy's life just got weirder and weirder. Well, I guess not weird, but, <laughs> but uh, he kept expanding out. So the uh, Yale running team and the U.S. Olympic team heard that there's this guy who's rehabilitating emphysemics in, in a way that no one else was able to do it. Maybe he can help the runners. And this was right before the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City at an elevation about 6,500 feet. So he worked with the Yale team, and then he went to Lake Tahoe and worked with the Olympic team. And within a couple weeks, these guys were breaking personal best records. They were running faster than they'd, they'd 
ever run. And then they went down to Mexico City and completely destroyed everybody. <laughs> it's the greatest track performance, I believe, ever in Olympic history and certainly for, for any U.S. team. And they did not use oxygen before or after the race. They were the only team not to do that. They said, we don't need to. We know how to breathe. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.